Good morning. I said good morning. morning. That's better. (laughs) You know, a church is not a boring place. A church is not a cemetery. Cemetery, if you want silence, go to the cemetery. But if you want noise, the church is like a maternal ward where there is labor pain and rejoicing. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> so a church should be like a maternal ward where we cry for souls and when they are born again into the kingdom of God, we rejoice. Amen. Sorry, I'm limping because I was almost canceling the trip. I had, um, you know, gout on my knees, swollen as you can see. But I said, God, I want to go. Heal me, touch me quickly. Yeah, so Thursday, I was zero. I thought I was not coming. And now I'm happy I'm here. And I hope you can see me. Amen. Can you see me? Well, I'm too dark. Uh, If you can't see me, at least you can see my teeth. (laughs) So I try to smile as much as I can (laughs) so that you can see the real Stephen. (laughs) Praise the Lord. I was once with the Billy Graham conference in uh, Amsterdam, and uh, Billy Graham told us about two boys who were boasting at each other. Their parents were were pastors, and the other one wanted to show off about his dad, that my dad is the greatest preacher in the whole world. I said, why? I said, you know what? My father preaches without notes. And the other boy says, how can I to do my friend? His father preaches without notes. So I said, no, my dad is the greatest than yours. I said, why? I said, my dad preaches without thinking. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope I'm thinking. I hope I have not. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> Yeah, um, I want to talk about from desperation to discovery. That's my theme this morning. As I share my story based on Mark chapter five, uh, Mark chapter ten, Mark chapter ten, uh, from verse forty-six, the story of blind Bartimaeus. That's what I want to share about this morning. And if my accent is bad. Well, that's Calvary accent. Because I didn't go to school, I was never educated. I've never been in a classroom to get education. What you are looking at now, what you are hearing at now, it is the grace of the living God. You are, uh, you are looking at a walking miracle of the grace of God. In your life, you have never seen a miracle Here is one, a living one. Amen. Praise God. And there was no way I could stand in front of you, especially as white people, because you were my target. You were the people I hated most. When I say most, it was with passion, with from my heart. And I didn't look at a person as a person, whether black, white, colored, or Indian. People were like shadows. When you look at a shadow, you want to eliminate that shadow. And that's how I I was. And these hands you see today, which which are carrying this uh, holy book, I don't know how many people I shot with a gun. Because... I hated anybody, and I never laughed from the age of six. I never laughed, not one day. Laughing was for sissies, and I had a gang of 40 boys, and I told them, you never laugh in my gang. 
And one day, one of my friends was laughing, holding his mouth, running around the corner, and I followed him. Why are you laughing? And I pulled out my gun and shot him on his leg just for, for laughing. I was unpredictable. Nobody knew what I would do next. But what I want to share with you this morning is that uh, uh, from desperation to discovery, Many people who are so desperate and many people who think uh, they don't have a, you know, maybe ice cream in the fridge, they think they are suffering. You know, I told Americans that you miss ice cream in your fridge, you think you are suffering. But just come to Africa and see what is suffering. Where people are desperate, even eating leaves. Like this poor little girl walking 60 miles on foot. That's suffering. That little girl was desperate. And this little girl left by the roadside, desperate, left to die. But God sometimes uses means that brings about a blessing into that, li that life. And so I want to thank God. I've served with the Ministry of African Enterprise for 35 years, and before that I served with the Dorothea Mission based in Pretoria. They are in Malawi and other parts of the, uh, Africa. And uh, serving there 17 years was by faith, never had a salary. But I had a passion to preach the gospel. I didn't look at what you get every month but what, how many souls I can win for the kingdom of God. And that has been my passion ever since. And wherever I go, I fly above the clouds. The unfortunate person is the one who sits next to me. I mean, you can't sit next to me in the airplane note without hearing about Jesus. I can't zip my mouth. And I don't go through immigration and keep quiet. As she stamps my passport, I talk about Jesus. Last night with my brother Steve in the restaurant, we talked with a young uh, lady there who was saving us. We talked about Jesus. So we don't zip our mouths because, you know, we are in a restaurant. And I take every opportunity to talk about Jesus. Amen. Now, I must be watching this gadget which you love so much. <laughs> hey, man. I love Jesus too much, but you love watches too much. <laughs> so let me watch it. It is 10 o'clock exactly. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> wow. Yes, Mark chapter 10 is a story of uh, blind Bartimaeus, a desperate man taken by the roadside every day. He had four problems. Number one, he was blind. Number two, he depended upon someone to take him from point A to point B and left him there the whole day. And number three, he had to beg for his living. Number four, he was the most lonely person on earth. Nobody stopped to talk about, you know, about life. He was, he was useless. He was junk by the roadside. Nobody even gave him what he should have because he had no value in the eyes of many people. He had no value. And for me too, I had no value in the eyes of my dad and my mother, and the community. I had no value. I became what I became because of a broken marriage. A broken marriage produces a broken society. A broken marriage produces all these gang members we see in the streets. They come from broken homes. The way they were brought up, they become what they become because of a broken relationship. So these young gang members didn't have 
a father figure. They have a prodigal father. Many, many young people have got prodigal fathers or prodigal mothers. And so that's how I grew up. I became what I became because of a broken marriage of my dad and my mom. I didn't have direction. I didn't have someone to correct me. I didn't have someone to send me to school. I speak in English today. It is only the grace of our Lord Jesus. And nobody didn't go to school, but I can speak 10 languages today. It is all about God. Nothing I can boast about what I am today. Are we together, church? So, that's where I'm coming. So, Mark chapter 10, here is the man with four problems sitting by the roadside. But when you sit by the roadside, you become a spectator. We have many Christians right here in this building, but by their but they are by the roadside. They are in the building here, but by the roadside. They are spectators. When we call for a prayer meeting, how many people come to a prayer meeting? When we call for coffee or braai, how many people come to the braai than to the prayer meeting? Very few people will come to, to the prayer meeting. But when you talk about braai, Human people like eating, especially you white people. Ooh, hi. <laughs> and Zulus, they like inyam. Hey, Zulus, inyam. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you know what? When we call for a prayer meeting, it's very few people who, who, who come. And when, when we talk about tithing, it is always 10% who make the church move. We are this big, but it is only 10% sometimes who make the church move, who are faithful. And so, here was blind but mirrors by the roadside. And it depended upon someone every day to take him from point A to point B. They are like the African cars. You know, South Africa is not Africa. But Africa come beyond the border of Limpopo. Then you see uh, Africa. Because you come to Malawi, we have got these cars that when you follow behind it, there's too much smoke. You, you can't see where you are going. <laughs> and, uh, and, and when they stop, he has to stop on a sloppy place. Because it does, doesn't have a starter. You, you have to push it. And then when you push it, it moves from, from, it goes. So there are many people like these cars, they don't have a self-starter. They want to be pushed every Sunday by the pastor. Every Sunday they need to be pushed. And uh, they, they don't have that self-starter in their prayer lives, in their Bible reading, in, in the, all the church activities. Because they don't have a self-starter. And... Uh, here was Bartimaeus by the roadside. But when you become a spectator, you become dangerous in the church. <clears throat> I was in Los Angeles preaching after preaching. I went to my hotel room and uh, I was, they gave me the gadget uh, remote control. Eh? Yeah, I wanted to find Billy Graham and all these great people. But as I was flicking this, thing, it was giving me different channels. But what surprised me is I was flicking it, and uh, it was changing channels. So I was so stupid, I thought I was like a little monkey. You know, I, I would do this, why is it changing channels without a wire from here to there? So I would look at it, and then flick it, it would change. And then I, uh, I was puzzled, and I would do like this. And then next thing, it brought uh, Muhammad Ali and Joe Fraser. They were boxing. And I fell backwards on my bed, crying with tears, laughing. Each time I looked at the street screen, I would laugh my lungs out. But I wasn't laughing at Joe Fraser and Muhammad Ali. No. I was laughing at spectators. 
They made me laugh because as these guys were boxing, these guys were doing like this. <laughs> they, they were not in the pitch, but they were all doing like this. Eh? <laughs> Have you ever seen South Africa, you know, Springbrooks, when they are playing England or France, when they go to a scrum, people don't do this again. <laughs> As if they are inside. But they are spectators. And in the church, when we say hallelujah, they also say hallelujah. When we say amen, they also say amen. But they are not in the business of the kingdom of God. Spectators. So I, I was like that, and Bartimaeus was like that. And what is the greatest verse in the Bible? If I were to ask one by one, all oh, those guys, what would you call the best verse in the Bible? Well, of course, many people call John 3, 16, and some will call other verses. But for me, <clears throat> my best verse, number one verse in the whole Bible, is here what we have, verse 49. After Batmia said, cried, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Some people rebuked him, be quiet, silent. But when he cried, Jesus, son of David. Now, a desperate man is the one who beats his chest. You have no way out, you are desperate. You are real desperate. And that was maybe the last time Jesus was going to be in Jericho. He was walking out of Jericho and he was desperate. A desperate man would try all means. Everyone told him to shut up, but he told his lungs, please help me out. Let me shout. And he shouted, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And verse 49 says, Jesus stopped. What a great verse. John 3.16 comes behind this one. Amen. Because that's where the love of God is demonstrated. When Jesus stops, that means heaven has also stopped. All the angels stop what they are doing when Jesus stops. Now they are looking down and said, hey guys, Jesus is stopped. Because they once heard Jesus say, there is so much rejoicing in heaven for one sinner when he comes to Christ. So they were all, oh, when Jesus stopped, they said, yes guys, it's time to dance. I like angels that don't dance the you know, European way. Because you white people don't know how to dance. <laughs> All angels dance the African way. Because we Africans, when we dance, we dance. Amen? <laughs> but you white people, you just dance like statues. <laughs> <laughs> so all the angels were watching to see how this man, what is going to happen. But when Jesus stopped, this is what happened. He didn't walk to where the to where the blind man was. No, he didn't go there. He stopped. The blind man had to take his own chance to come to Jesus. When Jesus does his part, you must also do your part. Even this morning, Jesus is going to stop for you, and heaven is going to stop for you. But he wants someone who says, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. So when he stopped, they said, call him. And the blind man fumbled to come to Jesus. Now, this is also strange. He comes face to face with Jesus, nose to nose with Jesus. And he stands there. And Jesus doesn't heal him. And Jesus said, what do you want me to do for you? Now, if I were Peter, I would say, now, Jesus, this is too much. You can see the man is blind. Just heal him quickly. <laughs> But Jesus doesn't do that. He's a gentleman. He, asked, he knew he was blind. Jesus knows your problem. He knows what you are struggling with inside. But he's asking you, what do you want me to do for you? Do you know so many people walked out of those day doors after being asked, 
what do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? Some come in with their burdens, they go back with their burdens. Some come in without salvation, they go back out without salvation. What a dangerous thing to do. <clears throat> so, that's what happened when Jesus, this man said, Rabbi, I want to see, I want to see, hey, wow. Jesus says, go, your faith has healed you. And his eyes popped up. You know, he doesn't see Steve. <laughs> no, he doesn't see Peter. He doesn't see John. He doesn't see, he saw Jesus. My brother, my sister, when you see Jesus, you are unstoppable. Nothing can stop you. Fear vanishes away. Shyness vanishes away. Because you have seen the invisible, the King of kings, the Lord of lords in your life. How can you zip your mouth? Once you see Jesus, you don't have foot and mouth disease. Many Christians say, I've seen Jesus, but they can't talk about Jesus. They can't go for Jesus. No, when you see Jesus, you are unstoppable. Amen. You are unstoppable. So, and the Bible says here, he followed Jesus along the road. He was not following Jesus behind Jesus with a long donkey face. No, he was excited. He was rejoicing. He was dancing for the king of kings. Hallelujah. Wow. Because once you find Jesus, it's a wow thing. You know, meeting with Jesus is wow. When he comes into a marriage, it's wow. He comes into a business, it's wow. It's a wow thing. Hallelujah. Hey, your amen is boring, yeah. <laughs> I think I'm in the cemetery. <laughs> so there was a rejoicing. So my story is really verse 49 where Jesus stopped for Stephen Lungu. I'm called Stephen Lungu. That is not my father's surname. I wish I was called by my real father's surname. But because I didn't know who I was, where I was coming from, as a street boy, dumped at my, uh, by my parents at the age of four, my mother took us downtown with my little young brother, who was two, my baby sister, and my mother said, hold your baby sister, I'm going to the toilet. Now, there's a young woman who was desperate, out of that desperation, she dumps her, her three kids. And why did she dump those, uh, the, those three kids? My mother was only 13 years old when she was forced to marry my father, who was 50 years old. It was a granddaughter marrying grandfather. At the age of 13 in their culture, here was that 13-year-old girl forced to marry this, this man. But my father <coughs> fought in two world wars and then fought in the Third World War. The First World War is that one in 1914. The Second World War in 1939. The Third World War was in his, in his own marriage. He was fighting another world war. When he married my mother at the age of 13, the only thing when I was born, I was born when she was only 14. She almost died. She was, I was put in the incubator for two months. And she was on under oxygen for a month. And later she had another child who was my brother, another child who was my sister. But at the age of 44, the only thing I knew was my dad being bastard. My mother being bashed every day with my dad. He was a jealous man. He was a military person. Two world wars. He was fighting another world war in his own marriage. And how many marriages now who fight and never forgive each other? And uh, so the only thing I saw was blood, blood, 
blood almost every day. And as a small boy, I would try to separate, save my mother out of this cruel man. But I would be pushed aside every day, day in and out. When he saw footprints at the house, who was there at the house? Someone was sleeping with you. She would be beaten severely. Oh no, it's a guy who was selling tomatoes. My mother would have the hiding. One day he pushed me against the wall and my head was bleeding. And I turned towards my father, looked at him in his eyes, and I didn't say a single word. And my dad said, why are you looking at me? And I didn't answer him. But in my mind, this is what I said. Let me grow up, and I'll kill you. I was growing up just to kill my father, the way he bashed my mother every day. And I just wanted to look for means how I could poison him, kill him, or crush the bottles and put them in this food, and so on. And so, one day my father disappeared. Left Zimbabwe going back to Malawi without telling my mother. And out of desperation, my mother takes me downtown in Harare and says, Steve, hold your baby sister, I'm going to the toilet. And she went to the toilet. She never came back. And here I was with a tiny little girl, baby. My brother was crying and I was crying. I didn't know what to do. The police found us after six hours in the cold, shivering. And they rushed with my baby sister to the hospital. And they took my brother and I to the orphanage. When they took the two brothers to the orphanage and our sister to the hospital, they separated the two brothers and their only sister. That took 39 years before we saw our sister again. And we used to ask, where is she? <laughs> At the orphanage upon arrival, there was these big bully boys and beat me on my nose. I was crying. So I was from one problem to another problem. And the teachers found me crying. He said, why are you crying? I said, I've been beaten by the other boys. He said, tell me their names. I said, say, I've just arrived. He said, boy, if you don't tell me the names of those boys, I'll spank you. I thought he was joking. He grabs me, ties my little hands around the pole, and whips me 12 times. I was screaming and waiting myself. But all that cry went to deaf ears. Following day, they would beat me, and I'll have 12 slashes. Third day, 12 slashes. Fourth day, 12 slashes. I could hardly sleep on my back. I could hardly sit on my back with the pain. And the fifth day, I was in the toilet outside. And I started shouting on my own in that toilet. I said, God, I hate you. I hate you. I hate you. Why did you create me to suffer like this? There's a time you look for death, but death doesn't come back. And so I started shouting against God as a four-year-old boy. And the teachers heard me shouting. He said, young boy, who, who told you to shout against God? And I didn't answer him. But this day I said to myself, from today, Stephen, be a man. Now here is a young four-year-old boy telling yourself, be a man. And I looked at the teacher. In his eyes, I didn't blink. And he said, young boy, you think you're tough? So he grabs me on the pole, another 12 slashes. But this day was different, very different. And I put myself and he whipped me 12 times. Not one drop of a tear in my eyes. I didn't cry. I just kept quiet. And when he looked in my eyes, he said, young boy, you think you're tough? You think you're tough? He gives me another 12, but not a drop of a tear in my eyes. He didn't realize that when a boy doesn't cry, you have created the most dangerous boy. Tears are very good. Ladies and gentlemen, it is good and health to cry. Never hold back your tears. There are so many people seated here. Maybe you are raped. You never cried. 
or maybe hurt by a stepfather. You never cried. Up to now, you are still hurting inside because you told yourself you are too tough to cry. And even the best specialist can never reach out to your heart. It will only take Jesus to bring that healing. <laughs> now you understand, when I looked at people, they were like shadows. That's the Stephen they brought out. I became. I'm coming from my father who beats his wife. I'm coming from the orphanage who is beaten severely. And I ran away from that orphanage, going to the bush, or with an aim to go to the bush, climb up the tree, fall down with the head first to kill myself. As I was going to the bush, and I was tired, hungry, and I saw an old road, and I went under that bridge and sat down. And I separated the sand and sat in the hollow and cover myself to cool the pains on my back. And then that became my permanent home from age five until when I was 21 years old. That was my home. I would go to the white suburbs, scavenge in their garbage bins, rotten food, stale food, all the bones left there. That's how I survived. At the age of 10, I started smoking. From cigarettes, I went to marijuana. From marijuana, I started sniffing glue. Sniffing glue, petrol, and so on. Formed a gang at the age of 10. And they became 40 boys, and I became the leader. Now, the leader had to be the most ruthless among your friends. There was no word like kindness in your vocabulary. No love in your vocabulary. You showed that you are a real man by being brutal. Showing that you were a real man now. And I told my friends, as I said earlier on, you never laughed in my game. I was always quiet. And so later on in my fighting, the people I lacked most to fight with were the police. I wasn't afraid of the police. And I said, I can face any police officer. That's the boy I'd become. And I would do armed robbery, broad daylight, when the owner of the house is inside, and if he doesn't help us, picking up his own things, first sign I would shoot on the leg, and the second thing on the forehead. And you have to help me carry your own things. So that's the boy I'd become. And later on, Fighting like that, I would, where, where God was a bit nice to me was I protected girls in the streets, although I was not born again. If I saw a girl with a boyfriend, I would mess up that boy like anything. So I'd, I'd do the parents know that you are in love? He said, once he says no, then he's almost gone. He's almost gone. That's how I was. And so you'll see boys separating with his girlfriend, running these two different directions, because that's how I'd become famous off. And then, then at the age of 13, one boy was laughing at me. Look at you, you're dirty, smelling. My hair was full of flies. I had my shorts, which had two windows at the back. And... Uh, <laughs> and he was laughing at me, look at your shorts and so on. And I didn't, I didn't answer that boy. But he did one blunder of his life. He came to push my forehead backwards. Look, you are stinking. And I pulled out my knife and went over him several times. As I was stabbing this boy, I was stabbing my father. I could visualize my father. And then my friend said, hey, Steve, what are you doing? And I stopped stabbing this boy, pulled out a gun, and shot my own friend. So I'd, be, I'd become like an animal. So from there, at the age of 15, joined Robert Mugabe as a freedom fighter in the bush, where we were trained with Marxist ideology that communism was the only thing in the world. So I got one from Mao Zedong in China. 
So Mao Zedong was like my God. I watched Mao Zedong. And from there I said, kill every white man. The only time you greet a white man, first you kill him and greet him later. Because if you greet a talking white man, he will call you kefa, baboon, he will call you all the different names. So first kill him and then greet him later. But there was one condition in our struggle. I said, if you see an Africana who is good, spare him. But any British, American, don't even spare any British and American. Now, why did we say in Africa? Because an Africana didn't cheat you. If he says, I love you, he means it. When an Africana says, I hate you, he means it. He was not like the British who stand on the line, no. You find a good Africana, he was really good. A bad one, he was really bad. <laughs> So that's how we lived. And so in the bush five years, there we had to put the clench with there's no God. There's no God. And I, and I said, you see anyone carrying a Bible, just a bullet. Anyone who talks about Jesus, a bullet. To me, Jesus was a white man's God. I couldn't worship Jesus. So one day, one girl was coming to share a testimony with me. I stabbed her with a knife left my knife on her back because she had talked about Jesus to me. So one day I had my, I was assigned to go and plant a bomb when I was 20 years old. And I was going to plant this bomb in the bank where many white people used to go on Sunday evening. And I was so excited that I'm going to kill many white people today. You are very safe today, don't worry. <laughs> you know, white people, when they are terrified, they become red, red, red. <laughs> and we black, we become pitch black. <laughs> but as I was going there, we, <clears throat> in the evening with my 20 boys, heavily armed, landmines, my AK-47, we were going there to plant that bomb. But as we were going, we saw a big, massive tent from South Africa. They were singing about Jesus. When I heard the name Jesus, I said, guys, before we go to the bank, let's go and spray the bullets in that big tent. I want every person in that tent to die. If you see your mother, she must die. If you see your sister, must die because they are all spoiled by this thing called the Bible and Jesus. I said, okay, I said, if anyone escapes, I'll give you a gift of a bullet myself. They said, okay, Steve will do that. So we went to that tent. He said, what time, Steve? And I said, at 7 o'clock, I'll blow the whistle and start shooting everyone inside. There were about 3,000 people inside. So I said, yes. So we got there, my friend said, Steve, it's five to seven. What do we do in these five minutes? I said, well, since we've got five minutes, let's go inside for two minutes only. Not more than two minutes. We look at the people who are about to kill, but if you see your father, your mother, your sister, they must die. I said, okay. So we went and, as it were, the only bench which was left at the entrance, like was left for 20 of us. So we sit there, and the tent was 100% full. They started singing choruses. But my gang at the back, we started singing out of tune to disturb the meeting. Made all sorts of noise, and one preacher touched my shoulder, said, boys, please don't make noise. And I pulled out my knife. I said, preacher, if you ever touch me, I'll kill you right now. And the lady jumped to this preacher and said, please, walk away from this boy, they are dangerous. And he walked away, and I started tossing my knife up and down. And all my gang members looked at, at me with a shock. They all like, what? Because that was not my character. If I pulled out my knife, I would use it. If I took out my gun, I would shoot. But I warned this preacher, 
if you touch me again, I'll kill you. So they were all shocked. I said, what? I said, but you just warned that preacher. And then I, 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 I was surprised with myself. That, that's true. I didn't kill him. And then suddenly, as they were seeing chorus, they invited a pretty girl from Soweto, from Johannesburg. Man, she was gorgeous. Whew. She was real pretty. She put me off balance. Hi. I said, now, how can a pretty girl become a Christian? Uh, that confused me because in my thinking, I used to think Christianity for the old, old grandies who are about to die. Or ugly girls who could not be proposed by boys. Uh, and so the only way out was to be Christians. So I said, hey, but how come this? But the amazing thing was, the more she shared his testimony, she was glowing. There was that radiance around her. I mean, I've never seen such a thing in my life. Like she had the bulbs around her, shining with that glory. And I said, hey, you see that girl shining? And my friend said, no, she's not shining. And I said to my friend on my left, you see that girl shining? He said, no, she's not shining. Then I got angry with my friends. I said, what type of eyes do you have, you guys? Can't you see she's shining? What I saw, they didn't see it. But then she invites another evangelist from Johannesburg. He stands up. The amazing thing is this. He preached in Zulu. And I heard every word in Zulu. I've never spoken Zulu before. <laughs> I've never spoken Zulu before. And I heard every word in Zulu. And as he was preaching that day, he, he read Romans 6, verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus. Oh, I've gone over time now. Should I stop? <laughs> I'm about closing. He'll crest time. <laughs> but Malawi time up to four o'clock. Because <laughs> we love Jesus too much. And you love your watches too much. <laughs> so, um, as he was preaching, he, he spoke about 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus, that though he was rich, he became poor, that through his poverty you may be rich in Christ. Then he said, tonight I'm going to talk about God's transaction. What happened in this transaction? Jesus was rejected in his mother's womb. I said, yes. How can I identify with that Jesus? Jesus was born in a manger where it was thinking that you may be born in a hospital. I said, yes. I can identify with that Jesus. Jesus had a borrowed donkey. Jesus had a borrowed house for his last supper. Jesus was crucified on a borrowed cross. That cross did not belong to Jesus. It belonged to Barabbas, but he took your place. And then Jesus, when he died, he was buried in a borrowed grave. And I started shouting. I said, how can the Son of God, everything was borrowed for my sake. And then he said, he went to heaven, sits on the right hand of God the Father, but he's coming again. But when he comes, he's not going to be the savior. He will be the God of judgment. That's the part of the message I didn't like. When he spoke about the judgment of God, every time he emphasized on every kind of sin, problem in life, I didn't like his finger. Every time he pointed that finger like he was pointing at me. He would point this direction, but like the finger was bending towards me. And he would point this way like the finger was bending towards me. So I pulled out my knife to kill my friend. I said, I will kill you. Why did you tell that preacher about my sins? And my friend took out his knife. He said, I will also kill you. You told him about mine too. So we faced each other with our knives, but it was that finger that made me restless. So as he preached about the judgment of God, 
that now I thought, oh, this preacher thinks he's clever. So when he would do like this, I would duck down <laughs> on my finger. And when the finger came out, so I was going up and down, up and down. That day I was a good Muslim, I think. <laughs> <coughs> and I was trying to avoid that finger. But little did I know that you can never hide from the finger of God. When that thing of God is pointing your life, you can try to laugh, you can try to hide in a choir, you can try to hide in a religious clock. Hey, my brother, my sister, when the thing of God is pointing in your life, there's an emptiness in your heart. You have never accepted Jesus. You have never said yes to the King of Kings. You have said yes to the things of this world, but not to Jesus. Today is your day. This morning is your, name, your morning. You can say, God, I've been very religious, but without Christ. Very religious without Christ. Never had any, any encounter with the king of kings. Maybe you are a married husband. You are not a leader in your own home. Because you have never had an encounter with king, the king of kings. And that night, as he was preaching the word of God, I picked up my AK-47 and all my bombs. I was crying like a little child, started walking forward. I'd, many people wait for a preacher to finish preaching, but while he was still preaching, I came and knelt at his feet, grabbed his legs, and they tried to move, him, to move me from his legs, and he said, please leave him alone. He went on preaching. While I was still preaching, a rival gang came, another rival gang came, and threw the bombs into the tent, blew up the tent. Many dead bodies all over. The night I came to Jesus, there were dead bodies all over. Some no leg, no hand, and so on. Every car outside was set ablaze. No car survived that night. The tent was in flames. The fire people were putting all the fire and were soaked wet. And I was still holding on the legs of this preacher. And after 40 minutes or so, it was quiet. And I was the only, out of 3,000, only one boy who was stinking, smelling horrible. I had never had a bath almost six months. I was horrible. Even the preacher was holding his handkerchief like this to talk to me. <laughs> That's how I was smelling. The Stephen you see today, it's only the grace of God. Only the grace of God. There was nothing I can boast about. I was thinking horrible. And as the preacher was talking to me, I, in my mind, I said, even the preacher can smell me. And then he said, why? What can I do? I said, can you have Jesus save a sinner like me? He said, yes, God loves him. The moment he says God loves him, I pulled out my gun, pointed on his forehead, in anger about to pull the trigger to kill him. I said, I'll kill you right now. Never tell me about God. I want you a Jesus you've been preaching about tonight. For me, I thought God was different. Jesus was different. And this preacher started crying. He said, young boy, you have told me your story. That's what I want to tell you. He said, look at me. In Soweto, a 14-year-old girl was grabbed by a man with a knife, forced in the bush, raped several times, and then she became pregnant. Nine months later in Soweto, she gave birth in a toilet, took that baby, Forced the baby in the toilet, ran away. Another woman was going to help herself, found a baby, pulled out that child, rushed to the hospital, the baby survived. Said, that baby's me. It was that evangelist who led me to Jesus that I was also dumped away, but in a toilet. You were dumped away in the streets, but me in the toilet. How many children have been aborted in South Africa? Who could have been another Stephen Lungu? How many children were aborted every day? Who can be another Billy Graham? 
who could have been a cabinet minister. This demon of abortion has taken South Africa. Oh, may God have mercy. And that night, he read to me Psalms 27 verse 10. Though my father and my mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. And that night I nailed down. I said, Jesus, come into my life. Change me today. I've tried to stop smoking drugs, you know, all these LSD and so on, injections. But Jesus, take over my life tonight. It was like from the top of my head, something was happening. I felt so clean inside. Man, first time in my life, I laughed. First time. I laughed and I cried. <laughs> Hallelujah. I started laughing. I started crying. First time tears couldn't stop. And the, the tears I held that day, they just came out freely. Man, freely have received. Hallelujah. And that a brand new Stephen was born. A born in Christ, the joy of the Lord and the peace of the Lord that surpasses all understanding. And at the bridge, I went to kneel down, and I said, God, I'm not, I don't know how to read and write, but what must I do? And the Spirit of God flooded my heart. I don't know what language I was talking, and suddenly an audible voice saying, Stephen, Stephen. And I turned around. I could hear it on top everywhere. And I said, I will open your eyes, and I will send you to many nations you do not know. And God picked up a nobody and made me a somebody and traveled around the whole globe. I've been almost everywhere on planet Earth. Two years ago, I was preaching at Pentagon where it's a no-go area with all the CIA intelligence. President Obama was there. Preached the gospel on Matthew chapter 3, verse 1, 2. Repent for the kingdom of God is near. To see these top military guys coming to Jesus. Last year I was preaching in, in European Parliament in France where they were about to pass a law that 12-year-old girls can have sex, can abort without the consent of parents. And I preached against that. And they had a tie that afternoon after I preached the gospel. Sometimes you have got to be aggressive to preach the gospel. South Africa now, the, with this head speech, I don't know where it came from. But you know, there's so much happening in the world. That's why we, as the body of Christ, we need to stand and preach the gospel. And when I accepted Jesus as I close, this is a Hillcrest closing. As I close, my watch is now in the pocket. <laughs> you know, I came to the Lord. A white missionary adopted me. And later on, she started teaching me how to speak a bit of English. And later on, eight years later, found my wife, a graduate. She married me, who never went to school. And I know she loved me because I was the most handsome man in the world. Um, if you don't believe it, it's your problem. <laughs> but she married me. She taught me how to write, how to speak the English I'm speaking today. She taught me how to hold a knife and a fork and how to eat properly because I used to eat like a pig. You could hear me six miles away chewing my food. But my wife said, please, honey, can you shut your mouth? And so I've learned to eat like you Europeans. And so it was through my wife, God started helping me to be where I am today. And I've got a big mansion in Malawi. I didn't buy it. Someone was blessed as I preached the gospel, said, I finished building this house. It's yours. And so I can tell you stories after stories of what Jesus can do. And Jesus brought a man who was a nobody and made me a somebody. But 40, 
uh, 51 years later, preaching in Harare in a big stadium, many people came forward accepting Jesus. As I was praying for the sick, one woman jumped up, I'm healed, and I prayed with that woman. And I said, God bless you, come again tomorrow. He said, no, I've got one more problem. I said, what is your problem? He said, from the story I've just shared, you are my son. And that was my mother, 51 years old, old later. 